Hey guys, thank you so much for joining with us uh, with another episode of PA Talks. And uh, on this episode, we invited Chad Oppenheim to join us from United States. Chad Oppenheim is a Miami-based architect and founder of uh, Oppenheim Architecture. And uh, his works has been praised for its ability to transform the prosaic into the poetic. Through passion and sensitivity to, towards man and nature, Oppenheim architecture creates monumental yet silent architecture that elicits a site's inherent power. So, just a couple of in a couple of seconds, I will invite Chad to join. Hello, hello, Chad. How you doing? Thank you. How are you doing? Ah, excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Thank you. It's great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Would you like to say hello to our audience? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Hope everyone's keep it safe. And uh, we're going to get through this. Super excited to uh, be here this morning and uh, talk about architecture. Yeah. Thank you. It's 10 a.m. in Miami. Uh, it is. I'm in Colorado. So it's oh, okay. uh, 10, 10 a.m. in Colorado. Uh, okay, I thought I thought you're joining for Miami. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's a little colder here. You can see. A, yeah, a scarf on. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's okay. So let's start from your initial steps into architecture, your inspirations, and how you came out with the idea of uh, Oppenheim architecture. Well, uh, I was really interested in architecture since I was a child. My parents, at the age of eight. Um, worked with an architect and I used to sit around the table to come up with our dream home and uh, that was it that kind of like set the spark and from that point on I was so interested in drawing houses all the time before that I was drawing cars that was like my thing and um, also about that time I started watching my father showed me uh, James Bond film the man with the golden gun. Yes. And uh, I, I was like blown away by the architecture of the villains hideout in this rocky <laughs> cliffs uh, in Thailand. And, you know, like that Star Wars, Blade Runner, all these things, all these like worlds of imagination um, began to influence me and, you know, and help me craft my own, you know, architectural language. And it took me 30 years, but um or no, 40 years about, but I ended up doing a book about all these these layers of uh, movie villains. And uh, it, it's a really fun book that took many years to put together. And it shows all the movie villains homes, yes. which are always like the best architecture. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so do, do you think this kind of like science fiction uh, has an impact into your architecture that you're doing now? Yeah, totally. I, I mean, it, it's kind of a mix. Sometimes we don't even realize that there might have been some sort of reference point in my subconscious. Yes. But I think, you know, our our experiences define who we are. Our experiences, like, help us form our, our creative language. And, you know, I, I think it's important to to kind of be true to these experiences and be true to your unique voice and your unique perspective. So, you know, like trying to kind of tap into everything you've seen, you know, I've been fortunate enough, uh, not recently, but to travel and work all around the world. So all these things have, you know, helped define my, my architectural, my architectural language. Wow, amazing. So you gained global recognition uh, for your socially environment and environmentally conscious architecture that set trends in the sustainable and humanitarian sectors. Uh, could you kindly explain how uh, you achieve this balance in your designs? Yeah, I mean, for us, our, our work really focuses on nature and, and really hopefully becomes almost secondary to the beauty of the natural world. And, you know, because we have such respect for the environment and let the environment the, the you know become the star of our work you know we have to be sensitive to it and you know we like to think of of architecture as one part of an entire ecosystem so what we really like to do is try and 
and and and design the ecosystem sort of the way that the the planet works right and how everything could feed off each other how everything can uh begin to help each other so you know when we do a project it's not just about going in there and doing a building we think about how we can help the people in the area how we can kind of build community how we can make the architecture do more than just provide shelter but you know can we create uh, vertical farms can we um, you know help the food sourcing and and working with local cultures around the world we're always trying to to kind of bring in that that spirit of place uh, where wherever we work and you know that's what makes it so interesting to to be an architect to, to work all around the world and study these cultures and almost be like an archaeologist uncovering the truth and then we will turn it into something new <laughs> yeah yeah your studio focuses on physical and spiritual sensitivity and beliefs in creating timeless and functional architecture could you share your thoughts on this yeah um you know we we search for the universal um you know we we try not to be concerning ourselves with with trends and things like that obviously very very difficult these days um you know where there's so much information but you know we like to think about universal truths you know scale proportion materiality procession through spaces everything we do is experiential and we like to say that that form follows feeling um and you know this this gives us uh, an architecture that we think is is rooted in sort of these universal truths and everything we do is about trying to make people feel good trying to make the environments better than when we we approach the project you know can we make everything better for for us as human species but also the flora and fauna on on each project so it's it's really about you know, regeneration and, um, you know, making the, the world a better place, right? Architecture over the last 5,000 years has kind of been about dominating nature. And, and we're thinking more about a coexistence uh, with nature. And uh, this was actually a studio that we taught at Cornell last year called Coexist. So. Yeah, amazing. So with this universal thinking, what is the importance and the place of context in your designs like what is the importance of context uh it's everything it's everything i mean the context generates uh everything for us and and the context not just what we find today but the context of what has existed there since geological times uh through the beginnings of civilization we really do a very very deep dive to try and uncover what each project should be. It's a, it's a arduous process, but we, we never start with kind of a, an end picture of what it should be. We, we, we try to kind of uncover it through, through this process. And, and that context could be that we're, we're doing a hotel in a city with you know, 30 amazing hotels. Like how do we find that unique experience, right? Exactly. Like, so the context is, is everything it's you know even financial you know how do you fit the building within the realities of, of a budget and and dialing that in to create you know the highest return for our clients yes we've seen this that you've you you're really doing this merging context with the uh, sustainability and also human humanitarian nature and you've created quite good number of amazing projects in a couple of past years past decades thank you thank you you're welcome what's your <laughs> vision for future of architecture and according to you like how can uh, architecture help in transforming uh, the post-pandemic world yeah well you know i think that you know the future of architecture you know i, I think we're heading um in a very good direction i i think the pandemic has has kind of accelerated our, our, our reality that nature is very important, right? That, you know, and, and I think, you know, obviously, you know, from what it's understood, you know, the pandemic in some ways was from a lack of respect of, of nature, right? And, you know, it was sort of, uh, 
you know, a way of, of realigning, obviously horrible uh, circumstances, but, you know, we, we kind of like pushed too far into nature and nature was kind of pushing back, you know, maybe subconsciously or no conscious, but uh, nevertheless, you know, I think that there is this kind of renewed sensitivity to the environment. Uh, there is renewed sensitivity to, um, you know, regionalism, not regionalism in that you're, you have to be working in a place where you live, but regional in that you're, you, you know, everything shouldn't look the same, right? Like in some ways there's, there's kind of like a, kind of a, a language of architecture that is kind of always like overriding things. And, and I think what's interesting is you're seeing a lot of really amazing work that is very sensitive to its place. And, you know, it's placed in terms of nature, it's placed in terms of the sort of uh, genius loci, the spirit of the places. And I, I think that's, that's really interesting. And I think, you know, the world is so uh, global in a sense where, you know, we're having this talk and people from all around the world are hopefully listening. Watch um, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but, you know, at that same token, I think we're seeing a reaction a little bit towards this very, you know, location specific um, responses to architecture. This idea of like, we like to think like when we're doing a project, we want to make, especially if it's in a, a very kind of remote and, and natu uh, naturally spectacular place, we, we want the architecture to disappear. You know, there's only so many uh, you know, untouched places in the world. And we want to make sure that what we're doing is almost invisible, you know, and that when we leave the project, it's better than what it was before. You know, the, everything was amplified, everything was um, made better. So, you know, I think we're seeing a bit of that. And, uh, and I hope that that trend continues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, at this, at the beginning of the pandemics, when everybody just goes, locked down uh -huh. uh, like these animals start going up to the sea oh, I know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that was so funny it was so good to see that <laughs> it is there's there's a little pushback you know yes. and, and and you know like it's interesting like i i spent most of the pandemic um you know starting in march in in miami and we saw the life coming back you know we saw with our eyes the water becoming clearer more sea life coming in dolphins and the, and and it, the the you know the skies were clearer you didn't hear the planes of course there were many horrible catastrophes but there was some some kind of i i think shifts um fundamental shifts in how we can think about you know like instead of me flying around the world like in march i had exactly to, I had to fly like literally like probably like 25,000 miles back and forth all around the world in March, like everything was done wow. virtually, you know? So I, yes. I think there are opportunities to, to learn from this and come out stronger than, uh, than we went in. Um, so, exactly. but we still have to be safe. I'm not wearing a mask, I'm, you know? So it, like, <laughs> okay, I just, you know, everyone should be very, very careful because, we're not we're not through yet yeah definitely <laughs> we need this still we need to take care <laughs> oh yeah for sure for sure yeah. uh your unique ability to balance the poetry and the proficiency of the building like the fantasy as well as the functionality is so inspiring uh, can you briefly share your thoughts with us how you how you build your concepts and your theme with in, within the context of the architecture and in your designs? Yeah, I mean, for us, it, I don't know why, but I guess it's like my, my upbringing as well. Like my, my, my own context is like, th I have to respect like the client's wishes. And, you know, that is not only, you know, what they want to build, but also how they want to build it and what they want to build it for. So, you know, we pride ourselves on, on being able to kind of like push the fantasy, but we push it with the buildings being hyper-functional. Um, many of our, our projects from uh, the beginning of our firm were in Miami where we were doing high rises. 
And, you know, for us, it was so important to make the buildings super efficient, that there was no waste in the hallways. I mean, it's like not sexy stuff, but it allowed us to do the sexy stuff, right? It allowed us to, if we made our buildings so hyper efficient, it allowed us to put that money where it could be seen and where it could be experienced. And, you know, that has been sort of a guiding principle uh, of our work. You know, it's this, as you said, it's this balance between the functional and and the fantasy. And, you know, it's really um, about pushing it as far as we possibly can uh, to a place, um, where you find that perfect equilibrium between, you know, the two. And I I don't think you ever really need to, to compromise. I think like that equilibrium is that, that perfect spot where, you know, the project has, has kind of found what it needs to be. And it's part of that exploration, but, you know, it's all about kind of thinking about what, what it is that would solve you know, all the, the check boxes, you know, like we, we make like a list of things that we need a project to solve, you know, like, and, and budget is always part of that. And, and some of our most exciting projects, um, you know, like the Isla clubhouse and in the drinking water in Switzerland, were done with no budget, like the most tightest budget ever. So I think that's like really interesting where you can kind of, with very little budget, make some sort of magic happen. And, and that's, you know, I, I think a real challenge. Yeah, exactly. Talking about your project, Isla Golf Center, uh, taking inspiration from uh, the natural dunescapes and mountains of the Jordanian desert, as well as the architectural heritage of the ancient Bedouin, is your recently completed project, which is called Ayala Golf Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, its innovative and organic waveform is also iconic. Can you share your thoughts about this project and about the inspirations? Yeah, sure. So um, it's one of our favorite clients. Uh, it's a Jordanian woman who you know is just an incredible visionary, and uh, we're about the same age. She might be younger. I'm turning fifty uh, in the month, oh. so I'm like, oh. okay, but I, I think she's younger. <laughs> If she's listening, I want to make sure that she knows that I think that I think she's younger. And you know, definitely, she, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, we were working on a project uh, with her in Jordan, and um, you know, I fell in love with the country. Um, I was was blown away by the the landscape. And what's interesting about Jordan is when you like fly in there, and when you you first get there. Everything feels very like hard and dry and kind of not friendly in a way. But, you know, like when you when you kind of go deeper, you know, the place, the people, the culture that I mean, the landscapes are so wonderful and so bountiful and so embracing. And, you know, she brought us to this site uh, in Aqaba, uh, which is very close to to Israel and Saudi Arabia. It's kind of in this very interesting location on the Red Sea. And, you know, she had asked us to to do an iconic building. And I was I, I kind of that word kind of scares me. Because <laughs> I, I, I feel like in some ways, it's like you you're trying hard to make something iconic. And much of what we do is trying to make things disappear, which is sort of the opposite of iconic. So we, we try for this, this notion of in a way like a silent monumentality right like that it's silent but powerful and and you know what we got to the site i was looking around and there were incredible uh you know rocky mountains of all different hues of of red and the earth and they had been working on on moving the earth terraforming the earth and there was a mixture of kind of like man-made and nature driven dunes and I, you know, I turned to her and and Beat Husler, who directs our office in Switzerland and and ran the project uh, from our Swiss office, and I said, I think we're done here, you know, <laughs> like everything is here, and like we can go home now. So you know, this idea of how we can almost find the architecture um, in the site and use the earth that was there 
to make an architecture, to make child. It's, it's almost like, a, you know, when you're a child, like playing in the sand, like digging tunnels and, you know, and, and making things. And, you know, we want it to feel so simple. We want it to feel like, you know, your child can do it. And of course it wasn't that simple. Although, uh, you know, and, and the execution of the building was, was simple. We actually built it all by hand uh, with, with workers, oh. yeah, local Bedouin workers who had never done anything like this before. Uh, so it, it was very interesting because we brought some people from Switzerland, like two people who were experts in shot key construction and we basically took it as a learning opportunity. So we had two guys working with about five guys and we built one building and we taught them how to do it. And the only machine we used was the pump for the concrete. Everything yeah. else was, was by hand, you know? So it's like, I love that, that imperfection, you know, that it feels like there's a soul, you know, modernism. Natural, is, yeah. yeah, modernism in some ways, like it's supposed to be like machined but we wanted to feel like that it was made by the hand or made by nature, which is perfect, sometimes imperfect, but there's beauty uh, in that imperfection. So it was an amazing experience and working with local artists um, to take the minerals of the surrounding mountains and integrate them into the, 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 the architecture was, was really spectacular. We have this incredible video of this guy blowing gold dust into the the wet cement That's and you know it, yeah. it's just really cool you know we love to to work with local artists and incorporate that type of um energy yeah yeah uh I ayala golf center is one of our favorite projects thank you i hope we can visit it someday yeah after the pandemic <laughs> i know i was supposed to be there it was one of my stops in march <laughs> And, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, but we never made it, but, uh, you know, we, let's, let's go, let's go. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so going through a couple of lines from your monograph called the spirit of place. So you said, you stated, how do you create an experience rather than a building? How can we evoke the spirit of place, the built world and, and the visions of this book demonstrate an architecture that attempts to realign and connect us to the world around us. Could you believe, briefly tell us about the book and what are you showcasing in it? Yeah, sure. I, it's, a, it's a very uh, curated book uh, of our work. And, uh, you know, it, it shows, I don't know, maybe, um, you know, 10 projects or something like that. And, um, and I wrote like a little haiku in the beginning. And, and the haiku was a mechanism to to try to capture everything with the most few words. You know, the haiku is like the Japanese uh, yes. poem, which is syllabic based, you know, based on the syllables. And, you know, for me, it was like always in our work, we're trying to capture the most and experience the most with the min like the least. And it's not minimalism. It's more what we think about is crafting the essential. It's like reducing it down to what's essential, like similar to the way like in cooking, when you, you take out like the, the water in something and the, and the power and the flavor comes, comes through. So, you know, the, the spirit of place is, is all about connecting. Um, you know, we have become the most connected species that have ever lived this planet. Uh, assuming you don't believe aliens were here before us or well, we might be aliens, but nevertheless, yeah. um, you know, we, we are able like now to communicate instantaneously, um, you know, from around the world, but in some ways this, you know, there's always a double edged sword. And in some ways that this ability to communicate, to dislocate, um, has, has kind of disconnected us from our natural world, our surroundings, our, you know, the people in front of us. I can't tell you, maybe not these days, but, you know, when you're at a restaurant and you see the kids on their iPads and the parent, one parent's on the phone and the other parents, are, you know, like there's <laughs> this, there's this like disconnection. And, you know, there's also a disconnection to place, right? Like technology has allowed us to do anything in a way, right? Like, exactly. and, and if you have the ability to do anything, like, what do you do, right? Like, you don't have to design 
uh, for climate because you can just fight the climate with technology, right? And you can mitigate the climate. So what we try to think about is, is really about how do we connect? How do we connect uh, with the place? And as I was speaking about before, how can we like pick up the clues and the, we call the spirit, you know, the feeling, the, the emotion of a place because we don't want like a, a project in Switzerland to feel like a project in Miami. Of course, there are underlying philosophies in our work, but we want our work to always be different depending on, on where it is. As you were saying, the context is sort of the generator for us. And, you know, we want to be able to connect with the context. We want to be able to connect with nature to frame a sunrise or a sunset, you know, and we often look at the way ancient civilizations worked with the land and they built more with the land rather than on the land. And that, that subtle distinction, I think, is very, very powerful. So we're always constantly uh, checking ourselves and making sure, like, are we building with the land? Are we connecting to the place, to the culture, to the heritage, you know, to the way that they built hundreds of years ago, sometimes thousands of years ago? Like, we love, you know, like working in Jordan, we, we created a project that, you know, we were using goat hair to weave tents, which is the way the Bedouin had have used in, for thousands of years. So, you know, or carving into the rock like the Nebataeans did, um, you know, for 2,300 years. So, you know, we love to learn and we love to, to root it in. And, and it goes back to that idea of, of the universal. In some ways, we don't want people to know when this was built. You know, was it found? Was it built? Is it something from the past, something from the future? We just wanted to feel amazing and, and connect you so powerfully to a space. And in many ways, oftentimes architecture gets in the way yes. of that experience. You know, it's so powerful. It's so in your face. And we want the architecture to disappear and let the, the place and let the people and let the, you know, social interactions uh, be what's most, most important. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So a couple of our audience asked about the name of the book. So it's Spirit of, Spirit of Place. It's available Spirit of Place. On, yeah, Spirit of Place. It's available on Amazon as well. I'll yes. share, share the link in the description yeah. on YouTube. So yeah. it could be available for anyone yeah. who pursues to buy. So, and the other one's uh, called Lair, Lair, L-A-I-R. Uh, Lair, yeah, Radical Lair. Homes of radical homes of movie villains so that, that's a fun book actually so yeah. it's uh, it's really Love great it. <laughs> we'll put that in the description oh yeah well. perfect thank, thank you. you amazing so uh wadi room desert resort is another magnificent project in jordan you built uh, your vision uh to carve 47 individual dwellings into the sandstone rock surface is highly featured and also highly discussed could you take us on a journey through your vision and also how you envisioned the project to, to perform? Yeah. So, you know, we get so, I, I get, and, and I, you know, and the team as well get so inspired by the site and, and oftentimes we get to an incredible site. And my first feeling is I don't want to do anything. It's perfect. You know, I don't want to disrupt it. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want, want to touch this site. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and, and, you know, the deserts, um, you know, in the Middle East are, are incredible. And, you know, there's some wonderful rock formations and, and, you know, the Nebataeans lived between, let's say like Jordan and Saudi Arabia and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, the opportunity to, to kind of learn from the past, you know, like how did these people, the Nebuchadnezzar, live in the desert 2,300 years ago? You know, they didn't have internet, they didn't have uh, television, they didn't have telephones, they were on the Silk Road, so they were on, on major trading routes. Um, but, you know, the, the, the secret is like how they were able to like collect the water. And, you know, there were like, if you ever visit um, Petra, you know, there's like these these very primitive channels that um, collect the water because it doesn't rain much, but when it rains, it actually um, 
in a way deluges and, and all that water is wasted. So, you know, it's a matter of like creating cisterns and diverting the water. So, you know, for us, it, it, it was a way of, of thinking about how to really build um, learning from the history lessons, if you will, not to do something that was historically accurate, but just to learn from the techniques and to think about how one could live in the desert in the most powerful way. And as I was speaking about before, um, you know, there's many times that um, you're in the desert and what's so powerful is the absence of everything, right? It's the absence of sound. It's the absence of cellular signal on your, your phone. It's the absence of the internet. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's what makes it so powerful and, and the ability to see so clearly into the sky. And, you know, everything we do is, is about amplifying um, those experiences and really celebrating uh, that uniqueness of, of each place. I like remember my, my wife who came out with us once and we spent with the Bedouin many evening eating incredible lamb and chicken that was cooked in the earth and singing mm -hmm. and dancing. And, and um, you know, and she had said like, you know, what's so powerful here is the silence. And, you know, when you go to a place like that, you want to do everything possible not to alter it in the in any way for the worse right and also the people there are so incredible and how do you like amplify their lives how do you make their lives better right this is not about just creating places that you know wealthy people visit it's about making something that is rooted in the community that you know the local crafts um some of which have been forgotten through the millennia and, you know, what we're trying to do is actually build schools uh, in the local village, art schools, and uh, to teach these crafts and to use these things. And, and, and that goes back to this idea of the ecosystem. It's really about, um, you know, creating an organism and how everything could work together and everything can prosper. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the way we, we approach these projects. And, and at the same time, it's, it's rooting each project in its unique place. And, and I think that's what people want when they, when they travel, they want the real, you know, they, they, they don't want like the same thing that you would find in New York and Tokyo and San Francisco. People want real experiences. And I, I think that's going to be even more prevalent as we come out. Um, I, I was on a, a call the other day and someone was saying like, you know, we're going to be in like the roaring 20s, like when this thing lifts, you know, God willing, in the, you know, <laughs> near future, people are going to be like, you know, going and traveling and, you know, doing even more than there was before, because, you know, the restrictions have been lifted. So, you know, I, yes. I think that I think it's going to be, you know, incredible. And, and our species is so adaptive, right? Like, it, it's been what, you know, since March, and, we've kind of learned how to, to adapt. Right. And, and you see people with masks, which is, which is great. And, you know, we're, we're, we're very resilient and uh, you know, and I think that, you know, these, this is a teaching moment for, for all of us. I'm, I'm still trying to pick up all the signals of what, <laughs> they mean, of what it means, but it's uh it's a, it's, you know, it's a time to be receptive, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So do you have a dream project, a vision perhaps uh, of something you want to bring into reality or ex exhibit your architectural magic? Um, yeah, I mean, every project to me like starts with a starts with a dream, you know, because we are kind of uh, realizing dreams. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking these ideas and turning them in, into reality. Um, and, you know, I, I'd say like there's a, there's a couple of confidential projects that, that we're working on right now um, that, you know, would be an incredible dream to, to be there when it's completed and, and experience them, um, you know, so they're under development. Uh, but I, I'd say like our dream projects are, are, are projects that can, um, you know, help us really um, preserve the, the natural world. 
um, you know, that help us kind of see the natural world and, and kind of celebrate it and, and help us kind of connect to it in, in a meaningful way. And, uh, you know, and there's some really interesting things that, that we're doing uh, with projects that are, you know, completely off the grid, yet so connected, you know, at the same time. So it's this idea of, of disconnect and connect. And also and, connect. You know, yeah, so that's kind of like, you know, our, our, our love. And, you know, we love to do things of all different scales, um, you know, from the individual home to, you know, buildings to the of the city. Uh, you know, we'd love to do more civic projects. Um, the drinking water in, 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 in Basel in Switzerland uh, was an incredible project for us because it takes the water from the river and turns it into drinking water for the people of the area. And, you know, I, I think meaningful projects like that, things where we're able to make the world a better place is, is what we love to work on. And, and that's our dream. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So awesome. So we're getting a lot of uh, likes and a lot, a lot of thanks comments and also uh -huh. question box. So I, I, I would like to inform sure. about uh, those likes. So uh, lastly, you have lectured wide, widely uh, and taught uh, in many architectural schools all over the world and you lectured about your philosophies and your works. What kind of advice would you like to share with young architects, young designers and young students who are pursuing this profession as their career? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I still feel the same way as I am when I was an eight year old, when I was an 18 year old, when I was a 28 year old, you know, like I, you know, it's, it's about kind of finding your, your voice, finding the truth and believing in what you do and, and resiliency. I, I was listening to a, a podcast uh, with Joe Rogan and Kanye West and Kanye said, you know, yes. <laughs> doubt, doubt, doubt is your, is, is our kryptonite, you know? And I thought that was like really profound. And, and I think that, you know, kryptonite obviously was the thing that hurt, hurt Superman, who was the strongest person in the world, or, you know, <laughs> at least as per the comics and the movies. But, you know, I, I do think there was some real um, wisdom there from Kanye which, you know, you have to believe. And that belief, no matter what people tell you, you have to believe and you have to follow your unique calling and your unique voice and, you know, and that passion, you know, and it's a tough road, you know, uh, being an architect, it's a roller coaster. Every architect I ever spoke to when I was young was telling me, don't be an architect, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, it, you have to believe in what you do and, you know, have passion and, and conviction and, uh, you know, never, never lose faith. And, uh, you know, so that, that I think is to me the most important thing and, uh, what I try to do all the time. Amazing. Amazing. Love it. It was so inspiring. Thank you. Thanks uh -huh. for such an inspiring, inspiring conversation. Do you like to add anything as final words? Uh, no, I just, uh, I'm very excited, um, you know, to be with you guys and, and sharing some of our philosophy. And it's, it's great that we could have these dialogues and, um, I look forward to, you know, meeting a person and, uh, you know, we all need to stay positive and, uh, you know, keep on keeping on. So thank you so much for having me. And, uh, it's an honor to, to be here with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor to speak with you. Thanks. Thanks for your time. <laughs> My pleasure. Everyone be safe out there. Happy holidays. Thank you. Cheers. Happy holidays. Bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Bye. Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of PA Talks. And this interview will be published on YouTube and as podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. And I want to thanks again to every one of you for watching and staying with us. And uh, thanks for Chad for joining the, uh, this episode of PA Talks. Uh, till another episode, another interview, stay safe and stay healthy. Goodbye.